radioactive face creams, radioactive toothpaste, radium-based medicines, devices for enriching drinking water with radon, spa hotels with radon baths, radioactive condoms. Sounds awful, right? Meanwhile, these are just a few of the radioactive products that were freely sold and actively advertised just a hundred years ago. In this issue of How It Was, we will talk about those not very remote times when radium was considered a panacea for almost all diseases. You will learn how the radium era in medicine and cosmetology began and ended, why fake medicines are sometimes healthier than real ones, and what exactly happens if you take three bottles of a radioactive drug a day. One evening in November 1927, 47-year-old Eben McBurney Byers, a still mogul, avid golfer and playboy, was returning on a private train from a football game between Harvard and Yale. Amid his alma mater's victory celebration, Byers fell off a shelf and injured his arm. A few days later, when the pain in his arm did not go away, he went to a doctor who suggested that he try a recently patented drug called Radithor. The drug was advertised as a panacea for almost all diseases, from hypertension to impotence. The active substance of Radithor was radium, an element for which, back then, medicine had high hopes. Byers eagerly began taking the drug and soon the dope eased the arm pain. But the patient did not stop there. On the contrary, to finally improve his health, he began to take three bottles of Radithor a day and enthusiastically recommended the revolutionary drug to his friends, colleagues and beloved women. He even gave some to one of his horses. Discovered in 1898 by Pierre and Marie Curie, radium immediately attracted the attention of the medical community. It turned out that radium is capable of killing cancer cells. You really can't take this away from radium. The only problem is that this element kills not just the cancer cells, but everything indiscriminately. But at first, the danger of radium was not obvious. While the prospects for its medical use seemed endless, Doctors raced to experiment with radium to treat cancer and tuberculosis, gout, rheumatism, diabetes, hypertension, impotence and depression. Almost everything. Soon, not only doctors but also charlatans of all stripes joined in the propaganda of radium. Fortunately for the scammers, radium did not fall under the US Food and Drug Administration Act of 1906 because it was considered a natural element. Fortunately for their victims, radium was not a cheap pleasure. So in most of the drugs ostensibly containing radium, there was no trace of radium. This was not the case with Radithor. Each drug bottle contained two microcuries of radium. The cost of a box of 24 Radithor bottles was $30, which is about 360 modern dollars. Its inventor was Dr. William Bailey. He claimed to be a doctor of medicine, MD, although it wasn't true. Since 1922, he had constantly been putting on the market preparations based on this element. Pain reliever, linarium dentarium for teeth and gums, caparium, radium hair tonic, and arium, a remedy to fill you with a new energy. Later, he developed the radio indoctrinator, advertised as the last word in scientific manufacture. It was a device worn with an adapter, like any athletic strap on that part of the body that the patient wanted to heal but it was Radithor that became a gold mine for Bailey. In those days, doctors were not sure exactly how radium heals. Bailey himself was convinced that it stimulates the endocrine glands. In his opinion, aging was a cause of deterioration in the functioning of the endocrine glands, and irradiation with radium contributed to more active production of hormones, meaning almost eternal youth. Bailey argued that Radithor, a mixture of radium-226 and radium-228 in distilled water, was a cure for the living dead, and doctors actively broadcast this idea to patients. After all, Bailey offered physicians a 17% rebate on the prescription of each dose of Radithor. However, Bailey was not alone. In the 1920s, the market was flooded with products and items supposedly or actually containing radium. Consumers could freely buy radium-containing toothpaste, 
Bath products, hair lotions, cigarettes, eye drops that allegedly cured both myopia and hyperopia, face creams that promise shining skin, you can't argue with this one, and even condoms. The ads often included references to sex and energy. There were radium rectal suppositories to improve male sexual performance and vaginal suppositories designed to fight female frigidity. A separate item of income were special devices for the enrichment of drinking water with radon, the gas formed during the decay of radium. Yes, that's right, at the beginning of the 20th century, people were sure that drinking radioactive water is very healthy. One of the most popular devices for this purpose is the Radium or Revigator, patented in 1912. The device was a large water jar made of radium containing uranium ore. Consumers were instructed to fill the jar every night and drink freely, averaging between six and seven glasses each day. The Revigator became your very own home radioactive spring, guaranteed to produce a health-giving drink. And if you had any leftover water at the end of the day, advertisements encouraged consumers to water their plants. Sheer and pure benefits. The only drawback of the Revigator was its large size, well, apart from such a minor inconvenience as radium poisoning. Therefore, soon more compact devices appeared on the market. The Radium Emanator, the Zimmer Radium Emanator, the Thomas Radioactive Cone, Emanators were usually made from uranium ore. Water placed inside would absorb the radon released by the decay of the radium in the ore. The device just had to be placed in a container of water and you needed to wait a little. Thanks to its small size, it could even be taken with you on trips. So that radioactive water was always at your fingertips wherever you were. Such devices were actively brought up not only by private individuals, but even by hospitals. Among the most famous fans of radioactive water treatment was the mayor of New York City, James John Walker. Three times a day, he squeezed the rubber bulb of a device called the Radiumator, which supplied water with short-lived radium emanation. He did not stop even when the use of such devices was publicly questioned. The richest were the most fortunate of all. They had the opportunity to go to special spa hotels and take radon baths. So, in the Czech spa hotel Radium, where radium was found in water samples shortly before that, it was possible to take a radioactive bath and breathe in radon through the tubes. Another hotel in Claremore, Oklahoma, was built on a sulfur spring that was advertised as radioactive, though fortunately for customers it wasn't. By the way, a remarkable fact, the spa hotel Radium still exists and still offers customers radon baths. Similar resorts operate in Austria and Germany. What happened to our tycoon Eben Byers? As you might have guessed, nothing good. He continued to take Radithor diligently and drank about 1,500 bottles over the years. In 1930, he began to complain of a pain in the jaw and severe headaches and, on March the 31st, 1932, he died in terrible agony from numerous tumours. At the same time, the former strongman and athlete weighed only 42 kilograms, could barely speak and his body was practically destroyed from the inside. The kidneys failed, the skull was dotted with holes, and surgeons removed most of the jaw attempting to stop the tumour. As it turned out later, even his bones were so radioactive that they posed a danger to others, so Byers had to be buried in a closed lead-lined coffin. It's even surprising that he lived for so long, as doctors later found out the dose of radium that Byers had taken over the years was more than three times the lethal dose. By that time, the danger of radium was already known, especially after the well-known Radium Girls case. Radium Girls was the name given to the women who worked in watch factories owned by the US Radium Corporation, applying radioactive luminous paint so that the watch numbers and hands would glow in the dark. US Radium Corporation's management and scientists already understood the dangers of radiation. They used precautions such as lead shields, masks and forceps to protect them from inhaling the dust and ensure they didn't directly touch the radium. However, factory workers were told that radium is harmless, so they not only worked without any protection, the management instructed them to wet their paintbrushes with their lips to give them a fine point. 
Soon, the girls began suffering and dying, but the powerful corporation pressured doctors to testify that these deaths had nothing to do with the factory work. Finally, in 1927, several women sued the company US Radium. Although the opposing attorneys had defamed them as hysterical women, they were eventually satisfied with a modest settlement. A few years later, all of them were dead. Most importantly, this case triggered more thorough research into the dangers of radium. After the widely reported death of buyers, the authorities finally woke up. The United States Food and Drug Administration hastily conducted an investigation. As a result, they removed radium from the list of approved medicines and banned the use of radithor. By the mid-1930s, all products that contained radium were discontinued. However, even in these circumstances, the enterprising creator of Radithor did not give up. He continued to assert that the unfortunate Byers was misdiagnosed. Bailey maintained his potion was safe. I have drunk more radium water than any man alive, and I have never suffered any ill effects, he claimed. Bailey was wrong. In 1949, he died of bladder cancer. When his body was exhumed nearly 20 years later, it was found to be ravaged by radiation. And 20 more years later, the radiation oncologist Roger M. Macklis obtained several original samples of Radithor and examined them. It turned out that even 60 years later, an almost empty bottle of a panacea for all diseases is still dangerous. If you enjoyed the video, please do like it and ring the bell so you don't miss new episodes of How It Was.